What's up, punks? Uh, today is a special edition of Block Digest, where we are bringing on uh, Ben Woolsley, a Bitcoin Core contributor working on an interesting uh, coin join related project called Snowball. So you want to say hi to everybody, Ben? Hello. And Janine, what is up today? Just teaching crypto things to people at parties. All right. The question is, though, are they sober enough to retain the lessons? Uh, well, these people definitely were, but and that's a good thing because apparently there's highly dangerous equipment in the building I was in that could kill you. So <laughs> it was a highly political debate about whether people should be allowed to access these machines. Interesting. Um, so not going to get any more details than just building dangerous things, arguing. Let's just say they had a machine with a laser and yeah, it's on lockdown. Okay. Um, I guess we'll, we'll move along from that. <laughs> 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 so, uh, I guess, uh, Ben, you, why, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you kind of fell into, to Bitcoin and winded up, uh, contributing to Bitcoin core. All right. Yeah. So I, I got to, I got familiar with Bitcoin in the first place around 2012, I think, and really just, um, was a passing interest. I, uh, liked the, the goal of the project and the spirit of it. Um, but it seemed like an experiment to me. Uh, and then as time went on, I, I got more, I started adopting it in different ways. So for example, uh, for rent payment, things like that. And then it wasn't until 2017 that I that I really decided to commit myself to it and to, to sort of work on it to make it my my daily work and that uh, that happened in the context of you know there was a lot going on in that year there was uh, the block size debate the ICO boom things like that and um, I was at a time I'd been working on web development in startups in San Francisco. And I was planning to, I had left one job, I was planning to start another. And I took time off just in between and spent uh, a few weeks reading white papers and watching videos. And it was the, it was seeing a, a real description of the Lightning Network that tipped me over. It was the, there's a talk by Joseph Poon and Taj Derja in 2015, uh, SF Bitcoin devs, where they described the system and the motivations for it. And that, uh, I was really inspired by that. I saw um, great potential in building layers of these decentralized systems that leverage one another to create and provide new, new capabilities and have new properties. And just the Bitcoin and the Lightning Network are the first examples of that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what what kind of stuff do you uh, generally like contribute to or work on or review in core? You know, it's it's kind of something, kind of something. like people don't really think about as far as normies go. Is like, you know, you're just a core developer or not? Yeah. So I actually um, I didn't start by contributing to core. I was at the at that time I was first interested in. I saw that the Lightning Node software was coming along. It was just becoming interoperable. So there's an interoperability test suite that was showing up on Reddit, for example, where they would kind of announce that um, more of the tests were passing so that these node implementations were becoming more and more interoperable and closer and closer to, to availability. And in that context, it seemed important to work on uh, wallet software because that's the the software that naturally follows the the node implementations and so I went and found I found a zap desktop on github and I started by contributing to zap and it was only um, after some months of that that I started getting into Bitcoin and that was um, that was in the context of uh, Jack Mahler's he had a concussion uh, 
from an accident and there was just uh, kind of disrupted the project temporarily. And in that context, I, I um, decided to focus on something else, which in this case was Bitcoin Core. And I, w I didn't really have specific goals. I more just wanted to get familiar with it. And the way I get familiar with a, a code base is I'll start by just um, just looking for opportunities to to sort of clean it up. So refactorings and uh, refinements that are that I can find just by looking at any given piece of the code. So I'll I'll just like review aspects of the code. I'll look for these opportunities, and this is kind of how I started was um, doing that sort of thing, and. The, the beauty of doing that, or at least the reason it works for me, is that it gives me early wins in terms of taking on a big project. You can have these incremental successes that um, that reward you along the way as you're increasing your understanding of the, of, the, of the space. So I've been doing that now for a year and a half or two years, and I have uh, continued to learn about the code base. I would say I'm, I call myself a student of Bitcoin, so I'm um, trying to learn. There's so much to learn about this, uh, and I have learned, uh, uh, you know, I continue to learn. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what, what kind of stuff uh, did you work on with uh, Zap? So for Zap, the, so this was um, kind of early in the, in the project. Uh, most of the code had been written by Jack himself, and I believe I'd have to go review pull requests, but it would uh, it would have been things like um, related to I think I established CI and did other such things. I'm uh, <laughs> I would I'm I don't have a specific thing to that comes to mind. Okay, I just kind of shocked at myself here. I didn't do uh, enough homework. Uh, I didn't know that you are. Uh contributed to zap i kind of <clears throat> poke into your github i thought you just kind of forked that just to play with it a little bit <laughs> i i did a uh, a few things it was it was uh you know there's a lot of work that goes into turning a project from a from a solo side project to becoming more of a um, multi-party collaborative development effort and those were the sorts of things i i worked on Mm -hmm. okay. it's just hmm. I'm just sitting here marveling at the fact that there's uh like already developers out there that are kind of finding their way down to the base layer coming in through second layers like it's kind of uh things are a, a little further along than I would have thought all right so um yeah I guess do you want to kind of I feel like I feel I guess, like making uh, one of those I feel like making one of those jokes where it's like, back in my day, developers came in through the first layer. <laughs> that meme will get made now. Watch. <laughs> but um, I guess, do you want to kind of, you know, move along into uh, Snowball and maybe kind of break down what the, the plan there is? Uh, sure. Yeah. So this, this project came out of uh, the Wyoming hackathon that happened earlier this year. And uh, I went to Wyoming in part because I was curious to check out the place. Um, I, I have a, a fondness for cowboy culture. Uh, I was born and raised in Texas, and I, I appreciate or respect certain aspects of it. And uh, anyway, it happened that uh, Justin Moon was also there, and we ended up collaborating because like, we were the most distinctly Bitcoin uh, people there in the space so uh, it was natural for us to partner on this thing and we talked over ideas and i had been really interested in the potential of um, local wireless mesh networking so for example you've you may have heard of bridgeify which is being used by the or at least according to media reports it's being used by people in hong kong to chat um, in a way that doesn't depend on the established uh, centralized networks and that got me thinking about, you know, how can, how can local mesh or um, wireless communications enhance Bitcoin and, and support Bitcoin? And um, at the same time, I had been aware of Samurai. I believe Samurai has a feature 
so Samurai is a privacy-oriented wallet. They have a lot of great features. They're doing a lot of research and development on building these things out. And But one video in, I had seen, I think, was involved um, doing a multi-round uh, pay join between two wallets where the communication mechanism was doing was basically um, repeatedly showing different QR codes to the phones so that they could collaborate on the signing. And it seemed like, and, and I, I knew that, um, that these kinds of collaborative efforts would necessarily be, um, they would necessarily be real time. You necessarily have to have these communication steps given the limitations of the ECDSA and Schnorr signatures on that front. And that's just a property of the system. So given that's the case, uh, wireless communications would be an ideal way of um, easing that interaction, right? Because, you know, an ordinary, a regular person is not going to go uh, do this multi-round back and forth. So if we went to make coin joins and pay joins kind of a natural property of the system that a lot of people are engaging with, we really need to change the, the mode of interaction. And that's, that's kind of the, the impetus for Snowball. And for anyone who doesn't know, I think that feature you just mentioned is Cahoots, right? Shinobi, do you remember? Uh, possibly Stowaway. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm actually not sure what the, what it's called at uh at this point. I know it used to be uh, Cahoots, but um, I think because they they had uh, I'm pretty sure they they had the the Cahoots feature, and they were also trying to work on something where you could keep adding. Um, stuff to the transaction um, and batch more before you actually um, submit it. I forget which is which. Well, yeah, because Cahoots is the one where it's um, collaborative coin join transactions between two wallets. And then it's, I just look quickly at the support page and it says that it's similar to Stowaway. But yeah, one of those two. There's a video on YouTube. Uh, it's a uh... Stowaway, stowaway collaborative Bitcoin transactions. We can post the link. Okay, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's it, in either one though. Yeah, it's the same kind of painful like scan and scan and scan again process. Yeah. But so you know, um, you know, like what what are you guys kind of planning on, on um, you know, actually like building though in the in the long term in terms of actually trying to implement this and get this out there in the space. Right, so, so the system in mind is the is that it's a feature for every wallet, for any wallet, and that when you open your uh, wallet, so you have two parties making a transaction in real time, like in uh, you know face to face. Um, they're going to communicate using QR codes, but they can also the QR code can encode additional information and can encode uh, connection information around how to make the Bluetooth connection to them, how to make a secure connection with them. And uh, supposing the recipient has this feature implemented, um, their QR code will, will include that information. And if the sender also has the feature implemented, then in scanning the QR code, they'll interpret that information and establish the connection with the, with the counterparty wallet. And that will enable them the basis for doing this um, multi part multi multi step uh, pay join process. So sending the the initial intended transaction to the recipient and then enabling the the recipient to collaborate and and adding an input and doing other such things. Okay, and so you kind of want to build this out as more just like a generalized like library or a module that's every wallet out there could just kind of incorporate or incorporate or pull in or re-implement if they have to and kind of just set uh, like a standard uh, on how to do this, right? That's right. Yeah. So particularly most wallets don't engage in Bluetooth. And so, and Bluetooth is notoriously uh, touchy and difficult to, to work with. So having a solid implementation of that and having something that can be um, vetted and 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 uh, reviewed well uh, will be a benefit to everyone. I think. Mm -hmm. 
And like, how, how do you see the kind of the road going forward with that, that being in terms of getting from, you know, your implementation to actually getting into the wallets? Like, well, what, what do you think is really going to be the, the driving factor to, to make that last jump there after you guys are, are done with the, the kind of reference implementation? Yeah, so our plan to get started is to do the implementation, the integration work ourselves. So we're, we've got a list of open source wallets that we're planning to integrate with and open pull requests around. And that should at least, I think, get the ball rolling. We should be able to, I think, um, get adoption from that. And hopefully um, in the medium term, the wallet implementers take up some of this work themselves. We're looking, we're looking to get, um, planning to apply to the unknown fund, which was just announced. Um, this seems like a natural fit for that. Um, but at the moment, it's uh, three of us. It's myself, Justin Moon, and Rob Balzer. Yeah, speaking of that, I, one of my questions that I wanted to ask is, um, what was behind your interest in working on privacy-related stuff for Bitcoin? Like, is it, are you, do you see like a market demand and that's just what you're following in terms of your development focus? Or do you have like a strong personal interest in working on this kind of stuff? I suppose I could say I just sort of geek out on this, these things. So for example, I think I think the idea of doing like broadcasting transactions via mesh networking is super cool. I think uh, like the radio, the radio transmission stuff that uh, Nick Zabo has worked on um, with, I guess, Elenu. And um, I think, you know, coin joins and pay joins are, they're, hmm. <laughs> I think it's a, so in general, in Bitcoin, we talk about fungibility as the important um, element of, of uh, the currency. And you can't really have fungibility without uh, with strict visibility into the into the system, and I think there's I think chain analysis is is inevitable, and as are the as are the responses to chain analysis, um, the implementation of features that increase privacy, and I think it's a it's a necessary part of the path forward to continue to enhance the privacy and to continue to have it be uh, assailed by outsiders. So I'm happy to participate in moving things forward in that way. I'm, it's not a particular focus of mine. Um, I, I generally just look for opportunities to improve the ecosystem and um, they, they end up taking different forms and showing up in different places. Okay, and like as far as the the actual implementation, um, your your planning goes. I I know based on you know everything you just said uh, regarding your interest with match networking, that's going to be the the primary communication medium. But like when you kind of get along to the point of actually putting a bit proposal out there. Like, are, are you going to think about, um, you know, leaving that open for extensibility to, to other types of communication and coordination? Like uh, another one that, that jumps to mind, obviously, is, um, you know, you can set up potentially Tor hidden services um, to coordinate this through. Yeah, absolutely. There's um, a Bluetooth is just the most immediate and uh, obvious one, but um, certainly like connecting over the internet, connecting over other services will be will be useful and will open up. For example, like you could have, you might want to um, have trusted counterparties that you want to participate in making these collaborative transactions with, just for your mutual benefit, um, where you have trust in them in the sense that you don't, you aren't concerned about them surveilling you, which is a risk of other of certain other coin join uh, actions. So, uh, and then certainly there are the things that are kind of nascent in terms of uh, Gotenna and, and other such projects. And those will be, as they become uh, more available, I think uh, it'll be useful to leverage them. And those are, you could naturally fit that in. If, you, if, the, if the 
protocol is designed well, then uh, that connection information should be easily uh, providable. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, kind of maybe not like a hard divide here, but just to kind of slide a little bit into or like towards just more general privacy discussion. Um, you know, kind of just implementing the the protocol to coordinate um, doing a coin join or a pay join and actually having some kind of heuristics to maximize the um, entropy you're introducing and how it's constructed are like two completely related or unrelated things. So like, are, are you guys thinking after, you know, ironing out the actual coordination and networking side of things um, going on to, to work on any kind of anonymity maximizing um, tweaks to things. Like I know um, Adam Gibson and Belker and uh, Laurent uh, were talking about kind of adding inputs you don't really need um, when it makes sense to kind of throw things off even more and things along that line. Yeah, definitely. So, so first of all, like the page join use cases, is attractive in part because it's so easy to negotiate because the the parties are there they're they're active naturally in the interaction and in terms of ensuring privacy or increasing privacy relative to that excuse me um, the what you can do is you can analyze the transaction that's produced by the pay join to ensure that it increases the the number of possible interpretations of that transaction so you, you can do subset sum analysis and, and other such things. Samurai put out a great um, script, which is uh, named Boltzmann. And that has some uh, transaction analysis algorithms implemented. So you can imagine real time just uh, applying that to the transaction that's being produced and then only broadcasting the pay join transaction if it significantly increased the privacy relative to the, the original. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I kind of see, you know, potential to really go uh, a long way uh, further than that in, in terms of just like um, the two participants playing around with things, you know, like adding um, specific disconnected outputs of yours just to create a connection there and then a different one later to kind of add to the, the fractal set growth or like if you really see this implemented in scale in any kind of um, place, you know, even potentially completely disconnected um, purchases and transactions to the same business could all get lumped into a single pay join like this and just kind of, you know, adding to the, the level of efficiency and privacy you could get. Yeah, I could definitely see things like that coming into being. There's a, uh... I think um, establishing the initial feature set will kind of open open the door to some of that by giving a uh, a form for those things to take and to interact with. So we're going to be intent on uh, doing that. Mm -hmm. All right, and then um, kind of another thing specifically with uh, pay joins that I kind of I, I don't really know how to whether to call this a problem or just a way things will change or whether I'm just being a complete idiot. Cause I was literally just uh blah brain fart. Um, th th this next brain dump is pretty much a result of talking to somebody just a few hours ago. But if, if pay joins become a standard way of transacting with somebody, then I still kind of see the, the potential for analysis there in some way if you don't take extra steps because if you are constantly just pay joining with people to send them money and spinning off your own outputs that you're not using to receive things with then eventually you know the, the businesses or the people receiving money start to stand out as these outputs that keep connecting disconnected clusters and transactions and having like incremental amounts added to them so if you don't take the, the step to kind of recreate that same pattern with the, the change output to yourself, like there, there's still heuristics here that can be used to analyze the, the, the kind of set of connections here. Yeah, that's definitely the case. And it's just, uh, I guess we can, um, kind of rolling back a little bit, the, 
the intent of pay joins are the first intent is to disrupt the common input ownership heuristic, which is a, an important heuristic for chain analysis. But um, there is this there is this property if it just if you just always pay join that you create this snowball UTXO that becomes a, a giant UTXO and then it's then you're no longer getting the benefit then all those transactions are correlated um, you're, you're no longer getting the benefit of multiple interpretations because it's clear which is the the, the recipient's UTXO <coughs> excuse me um, yeah so the the way to you want to build a system that avoids the worst of these problems and um, the analysis itself can can do that so if you're doing if you're doing this this analysis and interpretations of the transaction, then those that will naturally uh, avoid cases where the privacy is reduced relative to the to the default. Uh, and so, then we can at least say, according to those to that analysis, that we've increased the the privacy of this transaction. And certainly, you can go beyond that to um, address the the limitations that remain. But um, the combination, I think, of the analysis and the and the pay join uh, work together to mitigate that. Well, the the thing I'm kind of worried about there is just pure economic incentives kicking in, and you know, merchants just kind of doing things that way anyway. Like, you know, why would I want to fragment and, and keep these disconnected UTXOs that each have a cost to maintain and use when I can just sum it all up in one? Yeah, one interesting thing about um, Snowball relative to the to the earlier efforts, and the earlier efforts include um, paid endpoint and uh, bus to pay. And they, is that Snowball is is not particularly intended to be a, uh, merchant feature, although it certainly will be ideally included in their wallets and used by them uh, by default. But um, it's it's the the merchant use case that most uh, introduces this this challenge associated with having the the cumulative UTXO from repeated receive from continuously just receiving payments, um, and I guess merchants are most likely to have the the bandwidth more likely than an individual to have the bandwidth to to make a plan about how they want to deal with um, consolidating their their outputs and things like that whether through snowball or through um, you know separate transactions that would consolidate um, I think snowball will be an attractive uh, approach because it um, but uh, but I think privacy, people who are interested in privacy are more likely to adopt it than merchants, I would say. And so the, the uh, mobile wallet personal use case, I think, is, is going to be helpful for adoption. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one kind of uh, side benefit, if, if things go that way, uh, which I would honestly kind of prefer they do, uh, at least until I think this whole new like dynamic with uh outputs and the incentives like that is just kind of having something like this standardized across wallets it, it primes people for how interacting with second layers work because like the, the, there is really nothing out there except the side chain in terms of second layers that doesn't require some kind of network interaction to actually make a transaction and this kind of uses like the, the privacy benefit to kind of smuggle in like people getting used to that interactivity in a payment. Yeah, I would uh, I would agree with that. And um, certainly, it's important to um, to standardize this through through BIP as well. And uh, we'll be doing that. Although um, the in terms of one of the appealing things of the use case or the the user interface with respect to this is that it's i believe as minimal as it can be and that you can have basically the same interaction that you already do as as a wallet developer you already have 
the QR code display, you have the, the kind of, uh, you'll use the same screens, the same interface, it's just communicate different information to them through them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like the, there isn't the whole challenge of, uh, you know, abstracting a whole new set of information. It's just the, there's now a little back and forth in the background, and then it just pushes to the network. That's right. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to, to put you, Johnny, on the spot here in a, in a second. Um, Let's hear it. So what, what else are you, you thinking about in terms of privacy in space and what can be done to improve that? <laughs> well, the, so this is the, the most pressing thing, but um, I think future, future iterations of this will be, as, as we've been saying, like, uh, interesting. Um, I, I'm a fan of, um, you know, alternative modes of communication, mesh networking, so on, as I said, um, I do have, uh, I believe I have TX10 running at home. So if anyone wants to broadcast transactions through Gotenna, uh, <laughs> and they're in the vicinity of my house, then they will get that, uh, that relay from me. Very nice. Very nice. But, uh, let's see. How about Tor? Um, like, I, let's kind of shift over to, to the Lightning Network uh, for a second here. Um, are, are you as agitated as I am that Tor for the networking communication is not just the default in, in everything out there now that we're at the point where there are just wallets that normies are using? Yeah, I've been, um, this has been my main frustration with the Lightning Network for the past year or so and now i'm i'm really glad to see the new the latest releases of some of these wallets is, are starting to integrate tor on the ios side so i'm thinking of zap uh, in particular they i think they released uh tor integration uh in 0.5 um and there are a few more the uh i i have to salute the developers behind that yeah, i know this it's difficult to uh, integrate this kind of uh, background service on an iOS device, so uh, I I appreciate them for uh, going through that effort. All right, and and, and since we're on Lightning, um, I feel it would be remiss of me not to to bring up Lightning and CoinJoin and the kind of uh, combinations you can do there. Uh, considering you kind of first fell into developing in this space through the lightning like uh, have you been thinking of any kind of ideas or possibilities in combining those two things it's interesting i uh i mean i would definitely i think um i would look to do that maybe after schnorr uh, because then you can leverage the composability to to um to reduce potentially the cost. I think that's um, sort of uh, related to the concept of channel factories, um, having uh, maybe increasing privacy by having uh, many parties involved in the, in the channel creation. Uh, I don't have a uh, particular insight into that. I'm, I'm uh, uh, well, like SIPA, I'm not a cryptographer and uh, I uh, leave that in part to other people. So, um, one thing I would definitely recommend is uh, Waxwing has a very good uh, blog post on PayJoin. That was part of our inspiration for um, for Snowball. Um, you can find it on uh, joinmarket.me, which is his uh, his join market. And uh, there's a there's a lot to 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 find there. Adam is one of the uh, one of the few people I, I quietly go ask if uh, if I'm being an idiot when some idea pops into my head. Nice. All right, well, uh, Janine, uh, you have any questions stewing around in your head? Uh, nope. Um, I mean, I if you guys want to talk more about the unknown fund, because um, I just saw that yesterday, and I'm really curious. Like, I, I believe they said that they have $75 million available. That's right. Um, so have they actually published any criteria that they're looking for yet in terms of, you know, what they're willing to give money to beyond, I, I believe all I've seen is that they said that they're going to give it to 
projects that directly or indirectly are improving privacy in Bitcoin. That's right. They say preferred niches are personal data protection, tools for online anonymity, cryptocurrencies, blockchain associated with Bitcoin. Oh, actually, uh, they're giving out 75 million in Bitcoin. It doesn't say they're strictly Bitcoin uh, related improvements. Here's, uh, okay. here's a question. Um, what are you going to do if they give you a grant and send you stolen Bitcoin? Well, I uh, well, I hadn't contemplated that. Um, that's, that's a loaded question, <laughs> right? <Shinobi. laughs> right. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't. I, I think I probably consult with a lawyer would be the answer. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Just I, I wasn't expecting this to come up. We were probably going to talk about it on the uh, the the next. Uh, regular show we do so this is kind of a little teaser to to where my head's at <laughs> where that is i think there's a lot of need for um more for uh some kind of institute or or lab to advance and develop these ideas uh in a more project oriented kind of way so um justin had a tweet recently that was i think he said uh you know so many bitcoin ideas so little time and so there's basically a laundry list of possible um, hardware wallet improvements, privacy improvements, and other sorts of things we could do uh, if we form the organization around it and like create a, a vehicle for that. So uh, I'm hopeful that we can do something like that in the future. <sighs> See, <sighs> okay. Let me let me let me preface this with. Uh, no shit flinging meant um, before I proceed to fling shit. But like this, this idea of incorporate an organization and then fund things through that. I am really not a fan of that idea. I feel like when that gets done, you're effectively guaranteeing a devolution to a monopoly in funding on stuff that doesn't come from corporations and it's money's going to flow into this place because that's what they do and then it's going to flow out to who they pick because that's how that works and i'm just not a, a fan of that so i could see the the critique or the concern around centralization and i think um it's a valid concern and I don't think we should have a, we should, we don't, we shouldn't walk into or wander into a situation where we have uh, some kind of overbearing overarching entity. That's, that's, uh, you know, controlling the situation. Um, on the other hand, there are reasons for um, research institutions. There are reasons for uh, foundations. And that is that you can leverage the combination of people to greater effect than you might otherwise be able to do uh, if you did not gather them together in a, in a significant way. So like by increasing the communication and so on. Um, and I think the, the thing for us as Bitcoiners to do is to, is to be attentive to the ecosystem and to keep our eye on the relative scale of organizations and to kind of look for opportunities to, uh, diversify, diversify funding, diversify um, employment, so, um, diversify the types of institutions and how they're um, controlled. And but I don't think we should expect a future in which there are no such institutions because that would ultimately undermine the, the ability of the ecosystem to develop and advance. It's it's not that I think there shouldn't be any kind of, of organization or, or planning around that. It's I would rather just leave that void so that companies have to fill it to meet their own interests. And like at least that guarantees an alignment of incentives to some degree. Whereas trying to create like a a nonprofit or, or those type or types of organizations you're effectively 
giving like those companies an out to to just throw money at that and outsource their whole involvement and decision making and how that aligns with things it's just throw money and, and they'll handle it i'll push back because i think it's um it's not such a bad thing to separate the the research and development from the the institutions that have funds so for example i've been critical of exchanges for not supporting uh the bitcoin ecosystem as much as i think they should given the extent to which they profit off of it um and the challenge is it's naturally the case that inside these institutions there the whole organization is built around the idea of pursuing those the the revenues that they're that they're that are their focus right so um the whole incentives of the operation pull it away from effectively engaging in the, this this other work and this is a problem for in all sorts of cases like one I, i'm uh, i'm i like to recommend uh, the innovators dilemma which talks about uh the situation in which companies are unable to transition technologies because they're so focused on what becomes the legacy technology that they don't take up the new one and in that they talk about the importance of um, basically isolating, protecting any new efforts from the incentives of the surrounding uh, organization. So you need to give them uh, basically separate funding, separate leadership, so that they aren't, uh, so that their cause is pursued and not uh, diminished by the priorities of the surrounding organization. See, I don't think that's really going to be an issue in the long term. And I think that what we're kind of seeing with exchanges right now is just a blip on their radar. Like the, these, the, the dominant exchanges in this space are not going to be here in 10 or 15 years unless they get bought out by big legacy players instead of them starting from scratch or they somehow can compete with those legacy players. And I mean, it eventually goes to a place where that type of business is absolutely going to be throwing money at the, the kinds of development that the current businesses aren't because they will want to trust minimize everything they possibly can in their interactions with other businesses. And you maximize that by funding development. And, and you know, it's just, I, I, I'm enjoying this, this little mini debate here, but we just, I think, went way off down a rabbit hole. I, well, it's definitely an interesting conversation. Um, I'm, uh, I'm pondering how to respond, so, but uh, I don't have a media one. So. Well, uh, Janine, bring us back to some kind of coherence. Uh, it's privacy on, on Bitcoin. Wasn't that what we were talking about? Yeah, um, I, I think that's what we were talking about. Let's see. Um, well, uh, I, so, I mean, it's kind of related to privacy, um, but also security. I just saw, uh, was that this morning? It was either this morning or yesterday. I saw a report that at least two individuals have been arrested um, uh, in the investigation to figure out who's been sim swapping people and stealing their cryptocurrency. And I haven't looked into yeah, I haven't looked into the details of that yet, but I feel like like I feel like that the the, the kinds of attacks like that the people are, you know, getting sim swapped because these attackers know that they can get a financial reward directly from doing that. I feel like a lot of the at least in security but maybe also privacy the innovations that are going to happen in bitcoin to make people safer are going to end up spilling over into other consumer applications and hopefully whole devices as well um because this is still pretty much out of hand and crazy and the amount of money that's being lost is insane but it's highlighting the fact that so many of these devices are completely shit in terms of their security standards. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm actually relatively familiar with this space because I'm uh, looking into creating alternative. And um, the, 
the problem is really with the the mobile carriers. They have, you know, they they have a user base that does not have the security concerns in general that the that the cryptocurrency user base does, and there's an extent the the cryptocurrency user base is a relatively small component of their their user base. So they're trying to focus on you know holding market position and growing and things like that. They've got these massive bureaucracies essentially, and so their um, their prioritization of this issue is is less than than we would like. And uh, I think the the proper answer to that is to create institutions that are um, that answer to the Bitcoin public and like prior to, and by virtue of having cryptocurrency people as the user base um, prioritize and elevate security to the point where it properly protects the users from this kind of attack. Yeah, and one of the things I've been talking with some people about lately is that um, one of the things that's really hard in terms of, because like a lot of these these security vulnerabilities, I mean, these people are exploiting them to steal cryptocurrency, but obviously there's a whole industry around using it just for surveillance and, you know, surreptitious um, hacking where the tech, the victim doesn't even know that they've been compromised. And one of the things that people have been wanting to do is an easy way to change the IMEI number, which is for anyone who doesn't know, that's the international mobile equipment identity. And it basically identifies your specific device, um, and ties it to the SIM card. And, uh, the weird thing is that there's a bunch of people, like we were talking about this and everyone kind of assumes that changing that number would be illegal because it it's like, that would be super effective at, you know, countering surveillance and, but that's actually not the case. Like, uh, as far as I'm aware, there isn't, I mean, there might be in some authoritarian countries, but as far as I'm aware, I haven't. I haven't seen evidence yet of a country that actually says you're not allowed to do that, but there's this assumption that they would make it illegal if people actually did that. And I find that really weird. (laughs) Can you uh, restate that for just to be clear? Um, So you're saying the user changes their IMEI in order to uh, like separate themselves from whatever identity is associated with the IMEI that already exists. Yeah, because I'm, I'm assuming that like these mobile carriers, they're, they're, or even any networks they connect to, they're probably, you know, they're probably matching the SIM card with these numbers so that they can, you know, even if you change the SIM card out, they can still track you based on that number for the device and everything. The only place I've seen reference to this is that you can, as the, as the telecommunications company, you can, in communication with the SIM card, identify the IMEI of the device and so you can use that as an anti-tampering measure as a some kind of protection against um, you know theft or transfer of the of the sim card um, but at the same time people changing their phones is a relatively common occurrence so um, I uh, I don't see why it could be or how it could be prevented or why it should be prevented because some senile person in government said so. It's, uh, as far as I know, not illegal, so. Okay, but kind of circle a little bit back to Bitcoin with this. Like, you know, all, all, all the kinds of steps you can take to, um, you know, protect your privacy as far as the transaction linkages on chain go, like, they, they kind of don't matter if you you don't protect yourself on, on a network level on a, on the level of, of metadata so like really how, how do you think we're gonna handle over the next 10 or 20 years the the fact that despite all of these privacy improvements on chain like there's still going to be regular interaction with all kinds of businesses that create fresh metadata tags yeah, it's a real challenge. Uh, I think there's, in some sense, there's no absolute privacy for a, you know, a person who exists in the world. You basically have to, the idea that you emit no information is, is kind of a, uh, an unrealistic scenario. 
And so I, I think a, a good way of thinking about it is instead um, based on the anonymity set. And so there was an interesting blog post, I'm not sure who by, but I guess we can look it up later, um, which did it analyzed uh, Death Note from the perspective of a security analyst. So basically in this person writing these names in this, in this book to cause people to die, how, um, how could they be identified? Uh, and one of the ways they were identified was by revealing information which reduced their anonymity set. So that included um, doing it at certain times of the day, which sort of indicated that a certain area of the world. So you can just say that if only some subset, if some percentage of the world um, lives in this place, that this area of the world that is active during those hours of the day, then um, that population is now your anonymity set, which is which you lose a certain number of bits of security in doing in, in cutting down from the larger set to the smaller set. So the, um, so that would be a way to think about it. It's like, how do you, um, participate in a large privacy set? Okay. That, uh, I, one, I love that you, uh, used the death note, uh, comparison there, but you, you also literally just took that down to exactly like the degree I wanted to go into. I mean, it's like that the, there is going to be enough of a metadata trail unless all kinds of leaky holes get get patched up that the, the bigger Bitcoin grows, it, it turns into a surveillance system almost if you don't patch up those holes. Because yeah, you, you can, and it's not even just like times, you can look at the, the timing analysis of something propagating across the Bitcoin network and probably narrow it to a region even smaller than just this part of the world and, and down and down and down. So like, you, you know, how, how are we going to kind of mitigate that considering the fact that each thing is just a, a single patch? Yeah, it's it's. Um, I think it's going to be an ongoing challenge, and the and the general sentiment I think is that, um, well, there's not um, there's not ever absolute security or absolute privacy, but there's good enough security and good enough privacy, and you know whether security or privacy are good enough by the fact that the wall still stands at the end of the day, um, and so so the only thing so systems that do not uh nest, do not appropriately uh respond to the threat of this kind of privacy intrusion uh will not survive because they will will not um because people will not use a system that puts them at risk i guess and but that also depends on the scale of the risk and the and the necessary the 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 sort of form of that risk um so I would say it's like an ongoing effort to refine and we will only know through the failures uh, when it's not living up to the proper expectation. And in, in absent that, we have to kind of apply analysis and, and, um, and theoretical consideration. So pretty much just grit your teeth and uh, hope you aren't using something that fucked it up. Uh, <laughs> it's not easy. Uh, you know, operational security is not easy. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, you know, that seems like a, a fitting point to end it in my mind. Uh, so I guess, you know, Janine or Ben, do you guys have any kind of final thoughts you want to throw out there or any thoughts you want to end on? I do. Go for it. So my final thought, not to, not to stimulate the debate about whether to make an institute again, but if anyone does make an institute about privacy stuff in Bitcoin, please call it the cluster fucks because I want to, <laughs> I love that concept by no para. And I want someone to redo the cluster fuck badge from the U S military and make it into a Bitcoin privacy thing, because that would be so funny. I will support the meme. <laughs> yeah. Fine by me. <laughs>
All right, I, guess, I don't. Uh, I don't know if there's any kind of restrictions on the use of swear words in the name of a foundation or institute or whatever. But that would be. I would. If if you pick that name, I'll like. I'll be behind you. <laughs> well, you can only find out by trying. But I guess on that note, that uh, note, Ben, do you do you have anything you kind of want to say in a final thought or tell anybody where they can kind of keep up with what you're doing? Sure. Yeah. Um, I think it's just important for all of us to um, to actively consider what are the possible advancements for the space and how how can we contribute to them. I think it's um, it's easy to to live in a way or to fall into a stance of being uh, a passive participant in something when this is uh, you know Bitcoin benefits from what we can do to to advance it and support it and you know, the future future users will appreciate you for your uh, for your efforts all right well on that note uh, i hope you guys enjoyed this uh hope the uh the foundation argument wasn't too derailing and we'll catch you next time thanks bye <laughs> Was there, was there,